I'm Father Mitch Papko, and welcome to EWTN Live, our chance to bring you guests from all over the world. And tonight we have a guest who has penned some of Mother Angelica's most interesting thoughts, but his most recent project is more personal. Please welcome the editor of a new book of prayers and devotions of Mother Angelica and the EWTN News Director, Raymond Arroyo. Raymond? Great to welcome you, Father. Thank you. Welcome. It's a delight. Well, you know, one of your themes for your new show is talking about all that is seen and unseen. That's true. And we're going to be dealing with a, a realm that is belongs to the unseen in many ways. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of visible news, but it's the, the that good news of prayer and, and devotion to Christ that is at the very essence of Mother Angelica's life. Yes. Uh, you know, we've both known her a long time, a bit longer, but mm -hmm. it's um, you in many ways more intimately because of mm -hmm. writing so much mm -hmm. of her work. Mm -hmm. And this is something that uh, you can't admit, this new book that you've done called The Prayers and Personal Devotions of Mother Angelica. Yeah. Uh, what led you to write that topic? Well, you know, part of it was working on the biography early on in 1999, I came across so much material, Father, that I knew I couldn't shoehorn into one biography. So much of this material I sort of put to the side, but the archives were full of it. Uh, meditations. And the archives of? The archives of Our Lady of the Angels Monastery, okay. Mother Angelica's Monastery. Uh, there were prayers, there were recorded addresses that she had given to the sisters, part of their lessons, uh, talks to the laity. And all of this material was, much of it was recorded, but had never been transcribed. And though I had seen other bits and pieces of Mother's written work, uh, the little mini books and other things, right. there was nothing that I thought communicated her essence and that voice that is so Mother's. And when people see her on television, they expect the kind of feisty, fun, pithy nun that they, they love there. So in listening to these audio addresses, these audio um, lessons, it, to me, really preserved and captured her voice. And in the midst of many of these talks, Mother would create, compose spontaneously, under the guidance, I think, of the Holy Spirit, these prayers, some of them very practical, some of them um, dealing with financial turmoil, uh, others dealing with a big transition in life. Uh, she wrote uh, uh, for her nuns who were leaving one state of life, leaving the novitiate, going to the professed state in the monastery. She wrote a prayer for transitions. And this is something I think we all go through at various points in our lives. When we transfer to a new position you know, at work, when we uh, move from one state of life to another. Um, so th so what, what I did here was collect bits and pieces of her prayers and then later the devotion she prayed throughout her life. And I wanted to collect them in one space, in one place. And it seemed the perfect time to do it. I yeah. mean, and, and I knew that material was there. The second book I did after the biography was a collection of Mother's kind of spiritual wisdom. It would be like sitting around the table in the other room here and discussing the problems of the day exactly. or the challenges you were facing with her. Exactly. That was the um, little book of life lessons. The next book was her scripture studies, her lessons on the scriptures, and she unpacked them in a very practical and direct way. Some of it was based on notes in her Bible. And right. Such. Yeah, but notes in the Bible, uh, the lessons she gave just here in the backyard to, the, to, the, to lay people. There was a group of 50 lay women and later a much larger group. And that's how this all began. She taught them in the parlor. She'd open the scripture to any page and, that, and she'd launch in. And that, that was the beginning, I think, of much of her public witness and her public ministry, if you will. But the foundation, the thing that undergirded all of this from the very beginning, were prayers and devotions. It, and, and I wanted to capture those. One of the things about the, the, the prayers, because it, it's impo important to see this uh, in the larger context. Mm -hmm. Mother Angelica was not writing prayers the way some schlub is out writing cards to, for <laughs> greetings. That's right. I love you dearly because right. you're nearly and all this. Kind of, no, 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 no. This came from a, a context of a lot of deep personal prayer. Yes. Her rule for herself was to spend two hours at prayer for every hour at work here at the network. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about how that is a mm -hmm. seedbed for these prayers. Yeah, it is the overflow of that life. And, and the thing I love about this book 
Yeah, if the biography is sort of the dramatic narrative of her life, the facts of her life, this is the spiritual biography of this life because it traces back to the earliest devotions that she shared with me and her sisters. There was a, we had a contest a few weeks ago. What was the devotion to Jesus that mother was most devoted to before entering the cloister? And at the time I thought, well, it might have been the way of the cross because I know she prayed that. No, it was, we found a little prayer card and someone actually sent it to me. And it is a devotion to the left shoulder wound of Jesus, mm -hmm. which she prayed before going into the cloister. And on the back of this particular prayer card, it says, if you'd like more information, contact Rita Rizzo, and, uh, you know, which is mother's name. So, uh, yeah, before she became, before she became uh, Mother no, Angelica, right. Sister Angelica. Um, so, I, you know, I, that is here, as is the early prayers in the Poor Clares of Perpetual Adoration prayer book, which did, was probably earlier than the last century. It, there are beautiful devotions and prayers there that we know she prayed and that she told me she prayed. And then the latter devotions, the things her sisters pray every day, uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet, devotions to the child Jesus, all of that is here. In addition to, as you said, these very personal, heartfelt pleas, if you will. Some of them written in the chapel here on the EWTN campus. Uh, others composed for friends or before groups when there, there was a specific need. Mother was very attuned to pain suffering and the needs of people and I think she, she responded to that. In As a matter of fact there's a little clip I'd like to show of, from one of her programs. Uh, let's take a look at that clip now. When he said I'm going to prepare a place for you and after I've gone and prepared you a place I shall return and take you with me. Wow. Mm. Do you see now why you shouldn't worry? Do you see now why you shouldn't have that frustration about everything? Do you understand now why he says, do not let your hearts be troubled? One of the... One of the things about her that you also saw in uh, someone like Blessed Teresa of Calcutta mm -hmm. is that the actual content of the words mm -hmm. are very simple. Yeah. But the reason we have a response to either one of them mm -hmm. is because there's a ring of authenticity that, you know, is reverberating, reverberating beyond the words themselves. Right. And that's one of the things that I think is attractive, especially when you know Mother, about yep. listening to these prayers. No, these are prayers that you can pray on the bus, you can pray them at adoration, you can mm -hmm. pray them at home. They're, they're really prayers, and, and the way they're broken up here, if you need a prayer when your kids are in trouble or when you're suffering from some ailment, you can flip it open, pray, and, and go on with your day. And that's how Mother prayed. She prayed in the midst of the travails of the day, the responsibilities of the moment. She was offering those, those moments up, the hard and the good and the happy, uh, and also interceding for people wherever she was. And that's, I love the creativity of her prayer life, which you and I got to witness firsthand. I mean, I, I was with her today. You still see it. She is, you know, look, she's confined to her cell. She's not mobile these days, but she's laying there praying praying with her sisters. She's offering up her suffering. She understands why she's there and what this moment's about. Uh, and that joy that you saw in that clip, that kind of twinkle in the eye and the eyebrow raise, that's all still there. And her laughter and her, her radiance. There's something radiant about her that wasn't there a few years ago. Yeah, this, when you saw it today, uh, you describe her as being, being confined. In, in what way is she confined? Well, she can't, she can't dance around the room. I mean, she can't leave the room. She, she's basically in the bed these days. Right. Um, but she's sitting up. She's feeding herself. She's drinking. Uh, you know, she's praying. She's, they bring communion into her. She's active in her sister's lives. They all have, spend a little time with her each day. Um, it's a very... Uh, uh, you know, a bittersweet chapter because mother was such a outspoken um, doer, yeah. always, in addition to being a contemplative. And I know the sacrifice of, uh, that, that must be going through her now and, um, and that she's enduring because not being able to communicate in the way that she once did, 
has to be a heavy cross. But at the same time, the joyful acceptance of it, I think, is in many ways the fruit of her prayer. I think, and that was not, that didn't come to her easily. It was not an no, easy No, it wouldn't come thing. to any of us easily. No, no. But, but, you know, sometimes, you know, because she would talk about accepting the crosses in our yeah. lives, and she yeah. spoke about that. Yeah. She also said that you usually don't uh, choose your own cross, right. and this was not a cross she chose. No. And I think that this is where the, there's been a lot more struggle than I think folks outside might recognize. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't get to see her anymore. Yeah. And that really is a struggle for her spiritually, but as you say, she's come to accept. She's accepting, and, and, and what I love about it is Mother also is first and foremost, and lastly, a contemplative. And that's what this period, it's, it has been a long silence, no doubt. I mean, we're going on nine years now. Mm -hmm. You know, mother's going to be 87 in April. Um, the, the, you know, the stroke and the cerebral hemorrhage that really was the catalyst for so much of what followed, that was in 2001. Yes. So, um, uh, because we see her on television and, and she is so present because of these works, you hear her voice, she's, a, she's with you all the time. We don't often think the long period of time that she hasn't been in these chairs. Right. And, um, so today was, I mean, it was great to see her, uh, you know, in, in great form, having a wonderful time. I mean, we, let, we, you know, we walked in, I, I said, you know, we, we could have done the show here. You know, she was laughing, joking, and uh, it was, she was adorable in the best yeah. sense of the word. Yeah. Uh, so I was, and I gave her everybody's love, and I, as I've been on book tour, so many people come up. Exactly. I'm exactly. in the hotel room at night 12 years ago, and I was, you know, I, I, I thought I'd reached the bottom, and I got into bed, and I turned the TV on. Here's this nun talking about... You've got to take your life back. You've got, to get, you've got to go to the Lord. He wants you now. When was the last time you were to confession? He said, so, you know, I, I went the next morning. I looked for a church, and that was the beginning of my road back. And uh, I have her to thank for it all. So many people like exactly. that. And they wait in line to tell you. So, I, you know, I tell her it's such an honor to be the recipient and the sort of collector of her great work and to be someone to, you know, the, that people feel they can share it with. So it was great to tell her some of the stories I've heard as I've been on the road. Yeah, it, 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 same thing. I mean, I'm on the road a lot too, mm -hmm. and people have this, you know, tell the same kind of thing, how much they still love Mother Angelica. Yeah. It's, it's, there's a deep devotion to her because that resonance was detectable. Yeah. I oftentimes thought that the people who, you know, sometimes disagreed with her, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes mm -hmm. theologians and such, they always seemed to be more in love with their ideas and she was more in love with Jesus and the people. Right. That's what came across. And she, she was a mother and, and, and had a love for the people. And it would yeah. frustrate. Maybe they did have you know, more fancy ideas, but she loved the folks. Yep. And yep, that's what did. came across. And, she, and that came out of her love of Jesus. Well, then there was an inspired quality about mother. You know, when she would sit in these chairs, Father, there was no preparation. Mother would plop down and say, who we got on the show tonight? I said, well, I, I, it's, uh, you know, it's Father so-and-so. Oh, okay, what's he do? Didn't know, a thi didn't, didn't, didn't know a thing about the gas or where we're going. But when those lights came on, she knew everything. She could sit here and do a show like Dick Cavett. I mean, it was unbelievable. And, and the jokes would come out, and she had insights, and all of that, I believe, was inspired. And there were some nights you could almost see a veil drop, and there would be a hush in the room, and this material would start coming out. All of that is the fruit of that constant union with God and the fruit of her prayer life. Now, see, and not an easy prayer life. This was a tough walk many times for her. Well, here's one of the things, in mm -hmm. terms of the toughness of it, yeah. one aspect that has to, what people would, I'm sure, be asking, she's running a network, she's running a convent, she's mm -hmm. got a convent that's growing. Yeah. You know, a time when a lot of convents are shrinking. Hers is just expanding. Yeah. And new offshoots are coming, and all this growth is happening. Where did she find time to pray so much. Mm -hmm. How did she manage to do that? Well, you know, I, I asked her this many times when we were working on the biography and, and earlier. And she said, you know, what lay people have to realize is what Jesus did. And that's the model I use. In the morning, Jesus woke up, he went to the mountaintop, he prayed to the Father. That was his time with his Father. Then the apostles came out and stirred. And he spent, cooked with them, talked with them. That was his time with the community. Then the people started waking up as the sun rose, and that was his time with his people and the public ministry. And when that was over, he went back to the Father. It's 
cut, she said, one of the miseries of monastic life is that you never finish anything because every hour is prescribed, every hour is dedicated. So you get something started and up oh, the bell rings and you're on to the next thing. She said, one of the blessings also is that you learn to do something and drop it. She called it her do drop system. You do it and you drop it, she said. And that's good advice, you know, for so many of us that kind of carry the workplace into the home or the home into the workplace. Mother, when she hit that door and went into her monastery after working all day here, that was it. She left the affairs of the network behind, or tried to, and was fully engaged as abbess in the life of that monastery. And when the monastery was over, she was right on point in here, arguing with vendors and slapping you know, heads around, <laughs> including yeah. mine. Yeah. Um, so it was a, she, she had this amazing facility, and I think part of that was she prayed at every step of the, of the day, every step of the way. Um, when people came at her, she would pray. When a meeting started, she would pray. Sometimes it would be something tossed off. You know, she told me the story once, she called it the Allen Wrench story, where she was under a printer, they had a printing operation right. over here in the monastery. Right. And she was under the printer trying to fix it with an Allen Wrench. She couldn't get the thing to work. Very frustrated, she'd been under there for an hour and a half, and the phone rang, it was a lady asking for prayer. So mother comes out, takes the phone call, and she says, mother, uh, my daughter's boyfriend had a terrible wrestling accident, his neck looks like the spine's been severed, could you please pray for him, he's in a coma. And mother said, okay, I'll, I'll pray for him. She hangs up the phone. She said, Lord, get this kid out of Dodo Land. <laughs> and she went back to the printer, okay? She says, she, a few weeks later, she gets a check for $1,000 in the mail. And she doesn't recognize any of this. The woman said she prayed for her, or mother prayed for her. So mother calls the woman and says, this might be a mistake. You, you sent this letter. I don't remember praying for you. She said, oh, yes, remember I called you. You said you were in the middle of some printing problem that day. And she said, oh, my Lord, that was when I said, Lord, get this kid out of dodo land. <laughs> so sometimes, and her lesson from that was, even the most careless prayers that we kind of toss off in the midst of the day, if they're done truly, if they're done with intent, if it's, it, if it's with an open heart and in true communication with God, He answers those prayers. And the, one of the things that comes across in these prayers mm -hmm. is that those prayers that might be sort of tossed off mm -hmm. like she did. Little arrows. Yeah, still came from this background of meditation. Right. You know, when she was up early in the morning, before the office began, mm -hmm. before Mass started, and she was in the chapel with our Lord, she was engaged not just in, let me see, let me start accounting here. I got, right. I don't, no, she was she loves Jesus, yep. she, and I want to say the present tense, she loves yeah, Jesus. No, she does. And that that love is something that comes out. And one of the things that I like about, even the way she begins the prayer, like you have a number mm -hmm. of beginning prayers here. Yep, yep. She focuses on the need for humility mm -hmm. and the sense of her smallness. Yeah in the midst of Jesus' greatness. Mm. And this is a theme for her throughout the other prayers as well. And the weakness, that, that reminder, yeah. you see that constant reminder, God is most powerful in our weakness. And, and Mother, because of her physical limitations, the, the disabilities, the spine, the lame leg, the heart, all of this, she had so many... Bronchitis. Physical, yeah, I mean, there was one malady after another. Because of that, you know, so many of us are reliant on ourselves because we think, well, you know, we've got strength, you've got intelligence, you've got... Mother was denied many of those physical attributes. She didn't have the physical vigor or strength. So she was immediately more reliant on God and therefore more trusting. And that is the source of so much of what she accomplished. It was that total reliance on Him. And you feel that and see it in these prayers. And it's, you're right, it's an active dialogue. One of her nuns described it. They said, you know, I said, what, what, what happened when you walked in on her? You know, because sometimes she'd be praying in the chapel alone. I said, when you walked in, what did you see? She said, Raymond, sometimes it was as if she was lost in some deep meditation and her eyes were just fixated on the Blessed Sacrament. Other times she was literally talking to him the way a wife would talk to her spouse. You know, uh, sometimes she was agitated. Other times she was celebrating something. But whatever... You mean our Lord got it too? Oh, everybody got it. <laughs> everybody got it, but particularly our Lord. So, uh, but you know, it was that it, she loved him enough to bring everything to him. You know, she used to say, when I get a new pair of shoes, I put them on the altar. Lord, thanks for the shoes. You know, when she, when she had a bill she couldn't pay, she'd put it on the altar. This guy needs to be paid. And she'd leave the room. You know, so it was, she was very um, childlike, trusting, and fully, 
fully engaged and in constant dialogue with God at every moment. So it didn't matter if she was praying a, a well-worn litany or she was offering a spontaneous prayer for someone who asked her on the street. By the way, what, what is a litany? A lot of our viewers don't even know what a litany a is. Litany what is are, a litany? Yeah, a litany are tested and beautiful prayers to a particular saint or to our Lord. Uh, in here, you have a litany to the child Jesus. You have a litany to Mary. Litanies are just Litanies uh, to the uh, sacred celebrate. heart. Yeah, li sacred heart. It, it's something. Like, here's what. Here's a litany to divine providence, and it says here, uh, you know, divine providence, hope of our salvation. Christ, have mercy on us. Divine providence, consolation of the poor pilgrim soul. Christ, have mercy on us. It's a. It's a back and forth. It's a repetitive prayer. That, that lends itself to meditation and deeper meditation. But in also this case, to dialogue problems. because the community can always join in the Lord Response. have mercy. Right. right. So there's that back and forth with litanies and yet a deepening that goes on by repeating qualities you might not think about right. because it just doesn't cross your well, mind. Right. You get caught, you, you get, you, the, the rhythm becomes second nature and you're focusing on the focus of the prayer. Mm -hmm. In this case, divine providence or the child Jesus. But what I also love about this is uh, their mother went through a very dark period. Some pe people ask me, um, I had a lot of discussions with Doubleday's art department about this cover. They weren't, they, initially some of them weren't too keen on it. Um, I love the cover and the reason is I think it captures something and people, a lot of people have been struck by it. I love that she is in, bathed in this light coming from the window but she's encircled by darkness. And in many cases, this is sort of the portrait of what mother's spiritual life was. Yeah. She was being assailed by physical difficulties, attacks from outside and inside, and found herself in a dark place often, but she never lost sight of the light. She always was looking to it and eventually reflected it for so many others. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, a, there's a moment in her life in 1984 that I, I got into in the biography, but we never published the full prayer journal. She kept a journal only one time in her life, and it was during this period in 1984. I call it her dark night of the soul experience. Um, and it was a time where she had a very despair, a deep sense of despair, um, but she never lost sight that God was in control and he could help her through this. But she didn't feel his love, it was an aridity. She didn't feel like she could receive or give love. And yet those around her perceived no change in her during this period. They, they saw nothing different. She was joking, she was laughing, she was doing the show, she was out uh, speaking before thousands of people. But internally, she was, there was this death going on, this, this, this dark depression, if you will. Now, her mother had died. You knew her, uh, Sister Mary David, uh, May Rizzo. Actually, actually, I didn't. You didn't uh, know her? As a matter of fact, uh, that year of mother have, going through that uh, dark night of the soul yeah. was the year she met me. Oh, well, that explains it then. <laughs> but it was one of those things where, you know, I, I detected it mm -hmm. in the second show we did. Oh, really? Which was on a Holy Thursday. Uh -huh. that I'll never forget it because she began the show and... She's saying, you know, this is kind of a sad kind of feast because Jesus goes away. And that was the mm. theme of her opening to the wow. program. And then I come in as, you know, a, a, a young Bible student. I was doing my doctorate work. I said, oh, no, this is a great feast. This is really exciting because this is what makes all the sacraments possible. And then she goes, oh. so, she, so she let me carry her. Let, let, let you go but and you, then contradicted you, you. Right. No, 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 she didn't. <laughs> yeah, she didn't. No, she, I contradicted her that okay. time and got away with it. Oh, well. but it but, Not for long. But it, it was one of those things that you could see that that sense of sadness that she expressed in that show mm -hmm. was something that was there. And while I talked, and she, she liked what I said about the, the, the theology of the ascension related to the sacraments, mm -hmm. but still it was something that she felt as sadness. And that yeah. struck me as odd for such an important holy day mm -hmm. that she would feel down. And that, that was yeah. one of the things going yeah, on. Yeah, well, no, she lost her mother. The network was on very, very <laughs> thin financial ice at that time. I mean, it could have, she could have lost the whole thing and almost <laughs> I, did. I know. As you know. I, I was part of the, yeah, uh, the telethon. What did you do? A cha-cha with her for money or something? No cha-chas. But uh, I'm not that good at dancing. But uh, I did tell jokes and sing songs. Okay, well. So dancing <laughs> but, but with that, the stars, you heard it here first. Yeah. You know. And, and it was one of those things where it was that desperate. She was, you know, calling because it was near to the, really, mm -hmm. we had five days 
to, to get the money. What I love about these prayers, and I think people, you know, I, and we, the, the nuns and I wrestled, and Mother and all of us wrestled as to whether we should publish the whole thing. But in talking to them about it and consulting with Mother about it when we were working on the book, it seemed important because there are so many people, few people get to go to the mountaintop and see, have locutions and the angels talk to them and mm -hmm. everything is joyous and sunshine. More people than not experience depression, confusion, darkness. And here you see the beginning of this prayer. And these are bleak at times, very stark prayers, urging God to help her and to help her feel love. And you think she'll get over it the next day, and it doesn't happen. Or the next day, and it doesn't happen. But slowly you see her coming out of this. And I thought the trajectory of these prayers and the, the immediacy of them were important for the public because they can pray along with her, pray themselves out of the same darkness using her example. And that's what I love about Mother. It's, it's the, the flexibility of her prayer life lends itself not only to religious, but also to the lay experience and what we go through every day. Well, one of the things about the, that flexibility as you describe it is that on one hand, there is this, uh, I, I think, uh, as the groundwork mm -hmm. is, is the deep contemplation meditating on the, the Gospels, having an intimate and very uh, easy kind of conversational prayer yeah. as a friend to a friend right. uh, kind of prayer. But also, this variety includes the, the litanies that are very structured, yep. the rosary, yeah. meditation on the rosary. And it's and an original meditation. This is her, these are her actual meditations composed by mother for her community. They, these have never been seen before. Right. And I, I think that, the way of the cross, right. uh, you know, and they're so, again, she, she brings it right back to the personal experience. It's not, the, the thing I love about mother's whole uh, grasp of these events, they aren't something confined to history. There's something alive in the moment. We're in the middle right. of that fall with Jesus when he falls the second time. And she points out, you know, for those of you who are lost to drugs, those of you who are mourning over your children who've left the faith, those of you who are struggling with addictions, he's falling. You're there. You're there in the mud with him. And he wants to stand up with you. Stand up with him. You know, it's that kind of very immediate um, prayer that I think just strikes you. It's, it strikes you and it arouses uh, the soul.